Good afternoon. I'm Robin Koval, President and CEO of Truth Initiative, and I'm delighted to welcome our in-person and online audience to today's Truth Initiative Warner series titled Quitting for Good, How Digital Cessation Programs Are Making an Impact in Communities, Workplaces, and Beyond. At Truth Initiative, we're committed to making tobacco a thing of the past. And I know we're joined in that vision by our many public health partners, including those with us here today. Over the past 20 years, we've made tremendous progress. Since 2000, adult smoking has declined by 41%. But more work needs to be done when you consider that over 34 million adults in the U.S. still smoke deadly cigarettes. That number goes up to 40 million when you add in any combustible tobacco use. And while e-cigarettes dominate the headlines and conversations in tobacco control, let's be clear, there is still scant evidence that they are helping adult, smoke, adult smokers quit, as was hoped. Unfortunately, e-cigarettes command the front page because they've ignited a youth epidemic that's erased years of progress and addicted a new generation. According to the 2019 NYTS data, more than a quarter of high schoolers, 27.5%, are now vaping regularly. And in fact, 21.4% of those kids are using e-cigarettes every single day, signaling a severe risk of youth nicotine addiction and putting them at four times greater risk to smoke deadly combustible cigarettes in the future. In response to this, Truth Initiative has launched a first-of-its-kind innovative program called This Is Quitting to help teens and young adults quit vaping. Since January, over 64,000 young people have signed up for this free, anonymous, text-based program. And the early data show that it's working. Two weeks post-enrollment, more than half, 60.8%, reported that they'd reduced or stopped using e-cigarettes. And at three months, 15.5% of those respondents stated that they had quit vaping for 30 days or longer. Continued and persistent adult smoking and rising youth vaping rates underscore why it is more important than ever to keep our focus on advancing safe, innovative and effective ways to become to overcome nicotine addiction in all its forms. And that's why today's discussion is so critical. Today we're here to talk about the innovative and proven ways we have to help the nearly 70% of smokers who say they want to quit. We know that quitting smoking is really hard. It's a process that may, may take many attempts over a lifetime to achieve success. We're committed to, smoke, to supporting all tobacco users, smokers, and vapors through every step of their quit journey. I'm excited for you to learn more about how we've been working on multiple fronts to ensure that anyone who wants to quit has proven effective resources available at their fingertips. Our partnership with the Mayo Clinic, which you'll hear more about, has helped us guide more than 800,000 people through our Become an X program on their journey to quit. And our X program, which supports tobacco-free workplaces, provides effective treatments and innovative and interactive tools to support employers and health plans in helping their employees and their families quit. In fact, research shows that following the X plan quadruples a smoker's chance of quitting. And we're not alone in the fight. The CDC has dubbed 2019 the year of cessation. They have been working tirelessly to amplify the many resources, medicines, and methods that support people as they quit tobacco use. So let's get into the discussion. Our moderator for today is Maggie Fox, a journalist and writer with a special interest in health, medicine, and science. 
Maggie has served as global health and science editor for Reuters, managing editor for healthcare and technology at National Journal, and most recently, senior writer for NBC News, where she's written about cancer, heart disease, mental illness, and of course, tobacco. It's now my great pleasure to turn the program over to Maggie, who will introduce our panelists and begin the conversation. Thank you so much. You've made it clear that we have to do more to help people quit smoking. 40 million? It's a startling number. Now I'll introduce our panelists who can tell us more about how people can get free from tobacco for good. Next to me on my left is Dr. Corinne Grafunder. She's director of the Office on Smoking and Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She leads and directs all scientific policy and programmatic issues related to tobacco tro control and prevention. Dr. Grafunder joined CDC in 1987 and has 30 years experience working with national, state, and local prevention efforts. Before she joined the Office on Smoking and Health, Corinne was Deputy Associate Director for Policy in CDC's Office of the Director. She worked with the U.S. Surgeon General, leading the development of the first ever national prevention strategy. She also worked to strengthen collaboration among public health, health care, and other sectors, playing a key role in advancing CDC's population health priorities. Next to Corinne is Dr. Amanda Graham. She leads the Innovation Center of the Truth Initiative. The center's dedicated to designing and building digital products for quitting tobacco. One of these is the X program for employers and health plans. With more than $15 million in funding from the NIH, Graham spent 20 years developing, evaluating, and optimizing technology-based quit smoking interventions. She's an internationally recognized leader in web and mobile quit smoking interventions. She's published more than 80 peer-reviewed manuscripts. Graham serves on NIH study sections and on numerous editorial boards for journals. Amanda's an adjunct professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. Next down, Michael Burke, an assistant professor of medicine in the Mayo College of Medicine and the clinical coordinator for the Mayo Clinic Nicotine Dependence Center. Mike was president of the Association for the Prevention of Tobacco Use, for the Treatment of Tobacco Use and Dependence, and chaired the committee that developed practice standards for tobacco treatment specialists. At the Mayo Clinic, he supervises a program that treats more than 2,500 patients a year for tobacco dependence. One of the programs includes an intensive eight-day residential treatment program. He's licensed as a professional counselor and certified as a tobacco treatment specialist, wellness coach, and personal trainer. And at the end, Jennifer Gendron oversees sales, marketing, client success, and partnerships for the X program. That's the tobacco, digital tobacco cessation program for employers and health plans that we'll discuss more about today. Jen has two decades of experience in sales, marketing, client success, and nonprofit leadership with a business and clinical background. She provides leadership and a deep understanding of B2B go-to market strategies, new business creation, and channel strategy within the health and wellness industry. Most recently, Jen was Chief Revenue Officer at MeU Health, a well-being platform where she led its go-to-market strategy and directed sales, client success, and marketing. Offline, we are joined by Dr. David Price of the CHI Mercy Medical Center. He's mission executive and medical ethicist, ethicist there. The CHI Mercy Health Center is in Roseburg, Oregon. It's a 174-bed medical center affiliated with Catholic Health Initiatives. Roseburg's the county seat of Douglas County, Oregon. It's timber country and considered a medically underserved area. Tobacco use is still common there. Oregon officials estimate that 30% of residents there use tobacco of some sort. David's expertise includes spiritual care, palliative care, clinical ethics, pastoral counseling, community benefit and real estate management. He's been a hospice and home health chaplain. David now co-chairs the Tobacco Policy Committee for the Local Blue Zones Initiative. This is a lot of expertise in one room. Um, our webcast viewers likely have a lot of questions. If you're watching online, please type your questions anytime, and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end of the discussion. But I think we better dive in. That was a lot of introductions. 
Let's turn first to Dr. Grafender. Corinne, it seems crazy given what we know about the risks, but tobacco use remains the top cause of preventable disease, disability, and death in the U.S. The CDC's Office on Smoking and Health made 2019 the year of cessation. Can you tell us a little bit more about this initiative? Yeah, thank you, Maggie. And just first, let me start by thanking Robin and Truth Initiative for hosting this and really highlighting this important topic. Um, for as Robin said, we already know quitting tobacco is really hard, but we also know that it's one of the most important things that someone who's currently using tobacco can do to vastly improve their health. Um, and so we really did. We At CDC, we have, and we're the single federal agency who has full responsibility for a comprehensive approach to tobacco prevention and control. And we felt that 2019 was really a nice opportunity to put an emphasis on how cessation really is a part of that comprehensive approach to addressing um, the leading preventable cause of death and disability and disease in this country. We put the emphasis on to do two things. I think um, you heard these from Robin already, but I'll just repeat them again. To really highlight resources that are already available and to amplify and, and engage new partners in the conversation around what we need to be doing to really help the 40 plus million people who continue to use cigarettes and tobacco. Highlights from our work in the year of cessation include kicking off the year with our 2019 Tips from Former Smokers campaign, which was on air for 27 weeks in 2019, and for the first time ever featured stories not only from the Tips heroes themselves, but it talked about the impact of smoking-related health conditions on their loved ones. We're going to continue that theme into 2020 and continue to expand that theme, but we're really excited that we had the opportunity to, to bring a new part of the, the conversation to our TIPS campaign. We also, in 2019, celebrated a major milestone for the 1-800-QUIT-NOW portal. That portal is a, an opportunity that links callers to their state-based tobacco quit lines. And in 2019, we reached the milestone of the 10 millionth call to the 1-800-QUIT-NOW portal. And we're continuing to celebrate the 15th anniversary of those quit lines this year and anticipate, hopefully by the end of the year, um, having available a, a booklet that will really celebrate the accomplishments of, of the tobacco, the National Network of Tobacco Cessation Quit Lines, um, which OSH has been dedicating funding to for the last 15 years. Um, we developed a number of new resources. I would encourage you to go to our, our website, the TIPS website, as well as our, our OSH website. Um, to, we we have six new videos that illustrate how um, calling quit lines can help people quit for good. These are there not only for individuals who want to quit and are trying to quit and to give them more information, but they're also there for providers, for people who care about their loved ones who want to help them quit. We know that oftentimes people are hesitant to call quit lines because they are not really sure what to expect. And so these videos are there to try to help um, answer some of those questions and allay some of their fears. Um, we also, CDC, released with our Million Hearts colleagues a tobacco cessation change package. And what this change package does it pro is it provides practical tools and resources to help clinical teams in inpatient, outpatient, and behavioral health care settings integrate tobacco dependence treatment into their everyday practice. We have a couple of things that we also have on the horizon. We've been working with the National Cancer Institute, and we are exploring the creation of a national texting portal similar to the 1-800 portal, I think very relevant to today's discussion around digital. Um, the idea is that not that we would be providing a new service, not that we as CDC would be providing the, the actual text service, but again, the fact would be that there would be a portal that would have one unique access point that then would triage people to their state-based resources. So we're working on that with NCI, and our hopes is that that will be available by 2021. 
Um, we also have um, plans to, in the near future, release a best practices user guide on cessation in tobacco prevention and control. This will really help continue to guide our state programs. Um, we work in all 50 states and the District of Columbia and territories and tribes, and we want to make sure that they have the very best evidence available to continue to advance their work. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we are looking forward to the release of the next U.S. Surgeon General's report on tobacco. That report will be on cessation. We are now looking at the likelihood of it being released in January of this coming year, so January 2020, which will in fact be 30 years since the last time the Surgeon General had a report that highlighted and emphasized the significance and importance of, of quitting um, tobacco. We have a lot of new partnerships, but I'm going to also just hold on and maybe be able to mention some of those later. Excellent. That's, that's quite an arsenal of tools that you've got there. Can you talk a, a little bit more, Dr. Graffender, about how do you help people quit smoking? Do you know much about what works? And do the same approaches work for uh, vaping? And anyone else who wants to weigh in on this question, please do. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll start. And um, yes, so I think, you know, First of all, I started by saying we work from a comprehensive framework, and cessation is an important part of that. But what we know, and some of the folks in the room today and those on the, on the um, webcast um, may have heard either me talk about or seen the um, tobacco vaccine that we talk about, where we really do emphasize that cessation is one of a complement of strategies that really help not only prevent initiation, but also are fundamentally important to supporting cessation and and supporting quit attempts and, and successful quitting. Um, and that includes tobacco-free, smoke-free air, it includes pricing strategies, and it includes hard-hitting media, as well as robust, meaningful cessation support. So we start with that comprehensive frame and know that that's what, in fact, is going to be most important. Um, but then we also recognize that if we don't deliver it just like just like a vaccine if we don't deliver it in its in the right dosage and with the right um you know with the right um ability to reach all the populations that we need to reach that we're not going to be as effective as we need to be. So, um, so we, know we know what works, we know we need to do better. Specifically on, on cessation, there's also quite a bit that we do already know about what works in terms of intervention. So we know that there is you know, advice from healthcare professionals and that, it, and that is an important step in helping someone who's currently using tobacco to think about quitting and, and be, be supportive and quitting. We also know individual group and telephonic counseling all are helpful and supportive and are, have been shown to be effective. The seven FDA approved medications are available. We know that they work. We also know that they are sorely underutilized and so there's an opportunity there. Counseling and medication are effective independently, but we do know that they are most effective when done in conjunction with one another. And more and more what I hear from providers and from service delivery people is that it really is that combination that is most important in really helping many of the most severely addicted individuals um, in their quit attempts. Um, text messaging cessation interventions absolutely have also been found to be effective, and there continues to be growing evidence for inter internet cessation interventions, especially when they're interactive and when they're tailored. And then health system changes that really do, again, you know, look at integration. How do you integrate into the workflow? How do you integrate proven cessation support into, into routine care? I want to just touch on the adult vaping question also, the, that part of your question. Um, our position is that we already know a lot about what works in terms of addressing tobacco dependence. And those are some of the things that I've already touched on. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to e-cigarettes. We know a lot about helping people quit smoking and we need to modernize those approaches and we need to study them and we need to learn from our experience and we need to continue to evaluate are the things that we're doing helping us succeed. So we do know that we have to continue to build the evidence base, but we also feel that we can't wait until the evidence base is completely built. We have to begin where we are right now. And the good news again is that we do know a lot about what works. So um, 
I think that's where I'll stop, and we'll see what others have to add. Amanda, Mike, Jen, anyone else want to weigh in on that? David? Well, I've got a question for Amanda then. Uh, why digital? Um, is, is digital anything like quit lines or face-to-face -face counseling? So building on what Corinne talked about, ultimately the important step in getting what we do know to be the effective treatment components uh, it is getting them into the hands of users. Um, we can certainly evaluate different modalities. We can test different things in clinical trials. But ultimately, it's going to be the uptake and the use of those interventions that help individuals to break free from tobacco. There's kind of a useful framework that I think is very helpful to understand the real advantages and the real opportunity with digital interventions. Um, and it's, a, it's an equation that considers the population level impact of a particular treatment strategy, which is really a function of first, how many people will use it, uh, how many people can we reach with it, in other words, and then the second is how effective is that intervention. You multiply those two together and it gives us the ability to create uh, sort of a head-to-head -head comparison of the total number of tobacco users that we have the ability to reach and engage with an effective intervention. Um, and what we found with digital interventions is real advantages on both fronts. Um, we did an analysis of 12 years of data from the National Cancer Institute that spanned 2005 uh, to 2017 that looked at the health information seeking patterns of adults throughout the U.S. And one of the questions asked whether they had gone online to look for particular kinds of health information. In particular, information about quitting smoking. Uh, and what we found is that in 2017, one-third of all tobacco users had said that they had gone online to look for help in quitting. We did a rough calculation using census data, uh, and that's about 12 million people that turned to the Internet to look for help in quitting smoking. We know that makes sense. The Internet has really occupied a central part of uh, where we go to look for information, where we go, the Google has become a verb over the past years. So that's really on, on the reach front. We know that technology is in our front pockets. It's what we spend the most amount of time with. Uh, it's a ubiquitous uh, way that, that we interact with information. And so really on the reach front, I think there's a clear advantage. There's also evidence on the effectiveness front. Um, we did a systematic review back in 2016, and our results have been replicated in a more recent Cochrane review. Um, the results that we published were based on 41 randomized trials of internet interventions that had been published at that time. Uh, they included over 110,000 tobacco users, excuse me, tobacco users. Uh, and what we found is in those trials that compared an internet intervention to telephonic counseling, to face-to-face -to -face counseling, that the results were comparable. Um, there were a relatively small number of arms that allowed us to do that comparison in 2016. The evidence continues to grow, as Corinne mentioned. Um, but when you take a broad reach modality like digital interventions um, and you multiply it by the proven effectiveness in terms of quitting outcomes, the population impact can be quite enormous. Um, Corinne talked a good bit about quit lines and quit lines have done great service in this country for a number of years. What we see is that the penetration of telephonic counseling uh, has, has really been quite limited in terms of the total number of smokers who call a quit line. Um, and partly with funding issues, partly with uh, changes in technology preferences, we've seen a shift in how individuals choose to communicate. And so this is really the focus that we've taken in making programs accessible, uh, easy to use, and in a format that, that we know um, is, is where people turn to look for the kinds of information that we know they're looking for. The other thing that I'll mention, and to address your question about why digital, when we think about this chronic relapsing nature of a, of a very tenacious addiction, there are few other modalities that have the ability to stay connected with a tobacco user for the entire period of time that they need the information and support to break free from that connection. 
uh, from, from that addiction. Um, and so this ability 24-7 to access on-demand support, whether it's online, whether it's through text messaging, whether it's through um, digital coaching, really provides in a very scalable, cost-efficient way the ability to extend what somebody may be able to get um, connecting with a quitline coach, connecting with a healthcare provider to really provide an extension for an ongoing period of time. So I think when we think of population impact, when we think of sustainability, and when we think of scalability, those are the real advantages to me for why digital. I guess people are very comfortable with their tech. They sure are, <laughs> in all its forms. Dr. Burke, Mike, Truth Initiative and the Mayo Clinic have a partnership to deliver digital cessation. Can you tell us about how you use dinner, digital interventions at the Mayo Clinic? Can you um, also tell us if you have patients that are using these interventions to try to quit vaping? Sure. And yeah, thank you, Robin and Truth Initiative. And we, yeah, we've had a, a, a partnership with Become an X and uh, with Amanda for a number of years now, which has been a a wonderful addition to what we provide our patients. So we'll see patients who are uh, diagnosed with another health problem, and, and a lot of them, but you know, 3,000 or so patients a year uh, we'll see. Yeah, and, and where we start is, uh, um, you know, the question, why don't people just quit if they have a serious health problem? And uh, um, when, to understand when a person is presented with the importance of quitting, what they'll consider first is can they? Can they be effective in doing that? And the next thing they'll consider is how hard is it going to be? Am I going to be experiencing uncomfortable withdrawal symptoms? What about the stressors I'm going through right now? What about all the times that I failed in the past? And so a person's motivation to make a quit attempt um, needs to have a couple of different ingredients, right? It needs to have the person's um, uh, felt uh, efficacy, the belief that they can do it, the right information on how to do it, and the time has to be right. And so that's where I really appreciate the work that we have with, uh, with, with the X platform. Um, because uh, it can provide the right information and that right connection that Amanda mentioned for a person when the opportunity is right, when they, they need it most. In addition, um, you know, when somebody does make a decision to quit, th th there's, there's very little correlation, surprisingly, between motivation to quit and success in quitting. Um, the biggest correlation between making a quit attempt and success is how addicted a person is, and it's an inverse relationship. But if a person gets, as, as Corinne was, was talking about, uh, counseling and medications, it dramatically increases the likelihood that they'll succeed. We treat tobacco dependence better than we do diabetes, if you count similar measure. When somebody first comes in, is there... Um, uh, blood sugar, uh, they're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they give a medication, counseling six months later, are they, um, uh, is their blood sugar normal? Maybe 20-25%. With our program, we've, we've published, and about 30% of the people are successful six months after, after coming in to see us in, in, uh, uh, in successfully quitting. Um, so, um, when, uh, uh, with the, the, the partnership with Become an X, helps get people the right information when the opportunity arises that they're motivated to give it a try, and then provides the additional support and the counseling pieces and the information about medication so that they can sustain a quit attempt once, the, once, they, uh, once they try. So the partnership's wonderful. We're looking at new ways of exploring it and, and, and staying connected with patients um, uh, um, after they leave my office. Um, uh, uh, the question about vaping, you know, we're, we're certainly seeing a lot more vaping. We're seeing a lot of parents who are worried about their kids vaping. I, I've seen a number of kids over the, uh, um, um, uh, the past uh, uh, six months or so. 
I'd just like to make a little editorial statement about it. You know, during the past six months, as you would probably know better, but probably 2,000 deaths due to vaping that, 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 that have been seen, which is an awful thing. Family members affected, you know, it's just, it's just an awful thing, needs to be stopped. However, during that same period of time, over 200,000, probably more like 250,000 Americans have died from the use of tobacco. And so as Robin was saying, we need, we need to continue to stay focused on this. And while we're addressing vaping, making sure that doesn't take all the oxygen out of the room and we, um, we uh, um, fail to uh, address the combustible tobacco. But we are seeing uh, um, uh, uh, people for vaping. We, 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 we find the, be, uh, uh, the Become an X text message support a really useful tool. You know, it, it designates if you're between 13 and 15, 15 and 18, 18 to 24, or a parent and provides different information. And we think that it's a, um, a really helpful support. We'll be looking forward to seeing the uh, evidence uh, base uh, uh, supporting that. Um, not only are we seeing young people with vaping, though, we, had a, uh, we have a unique residential treatment program. So we'll see about a, a 80 to 100 patients a year, a, a year in, in what's uh, like a drug treatment program just for uh, nicotine addiction. So they'll, they'll spend a, uh, eight days with us. We're actually moving into a five-day program beginning in January. Just this past program, we had a relatively young woman, 62, who had uh, stopped smoking two years ago and had moved to vaping. When she stopped smoking, she had mild emphysema. When she came to see us, really severe emphysema, oxygen dependent. Um, and whether that was due to the vaping or not, I don't know. But she's been vape free now for the last uh, uh, two and a half months and really hopeful that she can do it. Has never been able to be uh, without uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, smoking or, or vaping uh, in the past. We worked with her to provide medications as well as counseling support, and she joined the Become an X community. The question we still have about vaping and how to address it is how to, how to use the medications. The product delivers nicotine in so many different ways. It really is a question that we're using our best clinical judgment. With this woman, we found the right combination. So far, so good. Anyway, um, but uh, uh, with younger people who are nicotine addiction, how, how the medications are going to fit in, we don't quite know. But the counseling support, we, we, uh, um, we think we know how to do that. What you've just described, Mike, is, is really intensive. Um, obviously a lot of time was spent with this woman. Can you create that same kind of relationship on a digital platform? And Amanda, you probably can weigh in on this as well. Yeah. That's a great question. And one of the things we do with uh, the Become an X platform is we have live uh, chat messaging. And Amanda and I have recently been looking at the, at the transcripts. And when we're talking about the counseling relationship with, uh, with people to help them quit smoking, I like to look at it in two parts. One is the, uh, um, the, the relationship itself. Does the person feel that you're trustworthy? Do you have an agreed upon collaboration? Do they feel understood? Um, and uh, um, so that's, that's uh, what I like to look at as the, uh, the rhythm of the relationship. What particular behavior change skills work we know less about that. We know relationship works to help people stop smoking, to help people make so many different behavior change, um, uh, uh, changes. What particular techniques work? We are still learning a lot more about that. So back to your question. Um, uh, can we develop the, the same relationship? I, I've been surprisingly pleased by how well the connection is experienced uh, by by others who are using both the Become an X platform and live chat messaging, um, that they uh, they really feel that they are um, uh, understood. They they feel that the information they're getting is trustworthy, uh, and that uh, that we can stay on this, the same page. So, uh, um, yes, we do. Uh, I think we are well able to have that rhythm of behavioral support 
with uh, um, uh, digital platforms. I'll just add one example to sort of bring that to life. Uh, Mike mentioned that we're going through a process of looking at transcripts and coding them, um, analyzing the presence of behavior change techniques and coding them for some of the other elements that you would expect in that kind of clinical interaction. And it's been very interesting to see the context that users bring to those interactions. Um, we had one in particular, just as an example, uh, of somebody who was the head of his company, um, was about to head into a board meeting, and was experiencing an overwhelming sense of craving right before going into this meeting. And as he's in a conference room preparing for a meeting, online with Mike or one of our other coaches chatting to get support. What can I do to get through the next two hours in this board meeting? And what can I do to sort of grapple with this on a longer term basis? That sort of connection, whether it's on a bus, whether it's in a doctor's office, whether it's standing in line at the bank, is the kind of accessibility and flexibility at the same time that it's discreet and it's private. Um, that somebody can engage with somebody that they feel that sense of connection with. I think because of the way we use our devices these days, um, you're able to see that kind of connection established relatively early on. Uh, and by the end of the chats, there's, there's a real rapport and a sense of camaraderie and these effusive thank you very much for your help um, to our coaches. It's like having a therapist in your pocket. It, it yeah. is. It is, in a sense. And yeah. June, you want to weigh in. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to add that. I think that's what makes X program different, right? Because when you think about a digital approach, uh, people think not human, right? High tech. But it's a digital approach that's multimodal and really does have that human component as well. Let me turn to you now, Jen. Um, in your work at the Truth Initiative, what do you see happening in the workplace when it comes to addressing tobacco use and vaping? Sure. Um, thank you for, uh, for having me, and I'm really pleased to be here with this esteemed panel today as well. Uh, so we're seeing quite a few different things, right? Employers are doing everything from nothing, so offering no support in this area, uh, to on-site classes and coaching, to telephonic coaching, to nicotine replacement therapy, um, to even now more recently devices to engage employees in tobacco cessation. But we're definitely seeing um, digital solutions uh, pick up speed in the employer market. And it's for many reasons. Many of them have been touched upon already today. Uh, but a digital approach has really broad appeal, right? For employers that have a dispersed workforce or multiple shifts, it's really hard to scale an in-person intervention, right? And for employees, uh, to Mike's point about self-efficacy, they can access a digital solution when they want, how they want, on their own terms. Uh, so I think those are some of the reasons we see uh, digital really picking up steam. And then just to really reemphasize Amanda's point, the other reason is, is that it's an ongoing intervention. So it's a support that you can offer to your employees all year round. It's not two calls and then you're done. Because we know, as Amanda said, this is a very tenacious disease. And it takes folks multiple attempts, upwards of six to 10 attempts to quit and stay quit. So we think it's really important to give them that long term, -term support over time. Uh, and also that multimodal approach. So it's digital, and they can access it online or on their mobile. But we also have um, the, our social community of tens of thousands of folks who are, are quitting and staying quit. We have the, the really experienced coaches. Uh, we have other digital tools. And of course, the nicotine replacement therapy, which is really important for the physical aspect of addiction. I just would like to underline the importance of the social support and the uniqueness of the Become an X platform in that the, you know, the really vibrant community that's uh, available there to support people at all stages of their journey or when they're re-entering the journey, which is, which is a very common thing. A you know, relapse is, is the most likely occurrence for any quit attempt. But the support community that's in Become an X is, uh, is extraordinarily helpful in my experience to people, and really unique. And I'll, I'll just add um, a, a research spin on that. Um, we were funded um, from the NIH a couple of years ago to, to pull a wealth of data out of our online community and to do some analyses. And one of the analyses that we published uh, in 2017 actually showed a prospective relationship between engagement in the online community and abstinence. 
Uh, so these were all tobacco users who were enrolled into a randomized trial. This was a large trial of about 5,300 people. And what we were able to see in this data set is that the folks in that trial who uh, participated in the community and participated more intensively were more likely to be abstinent at the follow-up that, that we did with them. Um, we saw a really interesting, uh, perhaps not surprising, effect that um, posting, communicating, actively participating, contributing in the community had a slightly stronger effect in terms of abstinence. Um, but even browsing, even lurking, um, sort of crowdsourcing their quit by reading the experiences of, of others was an independent prospective predictor of abstinence, which we really found fascinating and underscores what Mike has seen and heard in, in the experience with our users. Well, I can tell you as the parent of a teenager, um, they definitely form a digital community. And that device is not one-on-one. -on -one. You are interacting with a whole group. Uh, let's, let's go back to Corinne. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the CDC is doing to, to reach more people with cessation help? Sure, yeah. Um, first, I just want to, I hope everyone that's in the room and listening um, through the webcast is really hearing all of us, I think, say that, you know, what's so important and critical that I think has oftentimes been missing from the narrative is really this idea of chronic relapsing condition that in includes, you know, multiple attempts. And I think, you know, what's beautiful about digital as a, as a complement to all of the other ways that we know people who are trying to quit tobacco need to be supported is that that's exactly what they need. They need to keep trying and they need to keep being given opportunities to try and learn from those attempts and then, and then succeed. So with that as a backdrop, I just want to say that one of our emphasis areas with our year of cessation really was how do we do better by the populations that we still are not reaching and not really serving in, in the same way. And we, again, have very good data in these areas. We know just based on the data that are, that are available that we do not see the same success in populations by race, by education level, by poverty level, by their health insurance coverage, by their sexual orientation or gender identity identity, disability, occupation, geographic location, and military status. All of those are factors that influence not only disparities in tobacco use, but also in lower success rates in terms of cessation and ultimately poorer health outcomes. So we know that those are all just important things to keep in mind. Um, some of the things that we've started to do is, again, from our core program, which is the National Tobacco Control Program, which does include the quit lines. And I do want to say one thing, quit lines, it's almost a misnomer at this point. They're not just the 1-800 call and, and get a phone call. I mean, they have web pages, they have apps, they have text. They have, m m actually, most of them at this point have a text service. So it is a more robust service than I think, again, it goes back to a lot of people don't exactly know what to expect from a quit line. Um, so so they're, they're working hard to make sure that they really are able to give people multiple access points and multiple ways to get to the resources and support that they provide. They are all working on quit line protocols, and they've got, I think, over 50% of the quit lines at this point, because they're all state-based, and so they do vary. But they, over 50% at this point, have specialized protocols for populations that are experiencing behavioral health, um, so mental health and substance misuse um, challenges, for um, pregnant women, of course, for youth, most over 50% have special specified protocols for youth. Um, and then they're, they're developing protocols for like American Indian populations, populations that have been shown to perhaps need more intensive services and need. Um, so, so those are some of the things that are doing. I also mentioned the new partnerships and um, that's been where we've really focused our new partnership work. We have new partnerships with the National Association of Community Health Centers. When you look at who is continuing to particularly use tobacco and smoke cigarettes, there are health centers are critical, important, federally qualified health centers are are critically important partners in this work. And so we're working with them um, to really take that change package that I mentioned and really look at how they would look at the system in the health centers and start to integrate the steps there. We also are working with um, the American College of Preventive Medicine to look at the integration of tobacco use and dependence treatment into clinical care. We've in embarked on a, on a partnership with both the um, Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board and also the National Indian Health 
board, as well as a, a partnership with the Urban Indian um, Area Health Board to really try to understand where we have opportunities to use, again, specialized protocols, specialized websites, and, and also um, the expertise that comes from those communities where they have a, an important distinction in commercial tobacco oftentimes, and then also traditional tobacco. So being sensitive to those cultural um, realities and, and context is really important to us. And the last one that I'll mention right now, because again, it's really about extending the reach of, of cessation support and really helping meet people where they are and in all those access points is a partnership that we now have um, initiated with the American Pharmacists Association. Because if you think about people who interact with people with medical conditions, they've been given diagnoses, they have different, you know, they're, you know for whatever number of reasons, they, they're going to their pharmacists. They also know the medication. They know about medical, you know, the medication interactions potentially. They know about how to help guide and support people in medication. So we're really looking at pharmacists as, a, as an extender and another way to think about how to give people that, that full complement of support when they're trying to make a quit attempt and, and again, ultimately successfully quit. It sounds like you're reaching out to a lot of what are known as underserved populations. And I know David's going to tell us if we can get him back a little bit more about his. But Amanda, can you tell us a bit more about how digital interventions work with these underserved populations? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Um, 20 years ago, some of the national surveys would ask questions about whether somebody was on the Internet or not on the Internet. Um, and what you see more recently are questions around how many devices do people have and how frequently they're using those devices. And it really speaks to the, the shift in the technology landscape over the past 20 years. Um, so in terms of the reach of uh, digital programs or, or technology, uh, we know that nine in 10 US adults is online. Um, we know that virtually everybody is using text messaging. It's sort of the lowest common denominator in terms of a communication modality. Uh, and we see um, uh, relatively high rates of, of uptake uh, across the, the different demographic groups. That's not to say that there are no disparities. Um, but with an average of 9 in 10 adults being online and text messaging being somewhat ubiquitous, um, what we're really seeing is reach and penetration across the groups that we would typically uh, consider underserved. Um, what we're seeing is that 7 in 10 uh, U.S. adults who have an income under 30000 are online. That may not be broadband access at home. Um, that may, may not be broadband access in rural areas. Uh, we know that those are, are where some of the disparities persist. Corinne certainly mentioned um, some of the other demographic groups. But these are really technologies that are literally, as you mentioned, in most people's front pockets. Um, the challenge and really the opportunity for us is in thinking about how to create an experience that is relevant, that is personalized, that feels like it fits to an individual tobacco user, not only based on maybe who they are and the personal characteristics that they bring to the quitting process, but the changes that they make on an ongoing basis. Um, quitting is a dynamic process that Mike talked about, and certainly delivering an experience that fits as they move through that quitting journey is ultimately important. Again, that's really a unique advantage of digital interventions to be able to take the wealth of data that we have from individuals as they're engaging with the platform, knowing things about them to deliver that kind of customized experience throughout their quitting journey. We've only got about uh, 10 minutes left, so I'd like to remind people that are logged online, if you would like to type in your questions, we'll fit them in as we can. I think we've got David back now. So uh, can you please tell us a little bit about the community that you serve, David, and how digital inter interventions might be helping them? I would be happy to do that. And I want to thank Truth Initiative for sponsoring this important event and uh, my highly esteemed uh, colleagues on uh, the panel who uh, have the expertise uh, to contribute to today's, to today's topic. So our, our community is primarily a blue collar population and it's countywide, we have about 120,000 uh, members, which we're spread out. It's a fairly, um, we have several poor geographies that are isolated from one another. 
And one of the questions that we initially asked about incorporating a digital platform as a solution for tobacco cessation and also the impulse control issues was what is the likelihood of a single mom with three children working a full-time job and possibly a a part-time job to make ends meet? What is the likelihood that she's going to travel 30 minutes or 40 minutes uh, from a a community on the the periphery of our larger uh, geography to a traditional tobacco cessation class? And the answer to that was there's probably a very low likelihood uh, that she's going to be able to manage that either because of transportation issues, childcare issues, the cost associated uh, with the journey or other competing priorities. So we wanted to find a strategic way that we could reach some of those underserved and marginalized population groups, provide them with a convenient and accessible uh, platform where they could uh, interact with experts who could coach them through the, the quitting process. And then also to provide them with nicotine replacement therapy support. Uh, A lot of the groups that we serve don't have, they're either uninsured or they're grossly underinsured. And so that was critical to us. When we look at our county health ranking scores, there's 36 uh, counties in our region and we are number 34 uh, for mortality. So length of life is already an issue uh, for us. And in terms of morbidity, we range around 26 Uh, which has to do with a quality of life index. So for us, it's important to figure out what we can do uh, as a community and as a hospital to have a positive impact on this equation. So we're very excited uh, to be modeling this uh, in in our location, in our market. Um, We extend it to our employees, uh, as well as all the members of our county. We work with multiple stakeholder groups, including our CCO, uh, local uh, independent practitioners, We work with our FQHC and our rural health clinics also to uh, encourage the use of this program and promote its success. Thank you. We've got a question from the audience Audience. for Uh, for Jen. Uh, Someone wants to know the kind of uh, organizations you partner with to deliver these cessation tools. Great. Um, We really partner with all types of organizations. We certainly don't discriminate from healthcare like David to manufacturing to retail. We also work with health plans. Uh, There are certain verticals that do have a higher tobacco prevalence, verticals such as construction, uh, manufacturing, transportation, hospitality. Uh, But but I really haven't um, met an organization that doesn't do well with digital tools, really, to David's point. Um, Sometimes you might hear, well, my employees are low low tech or they they don't have access to the technology. But what we find is that most people do have smartphones. And for those folks that don't, we do have aspects of our program, like the text messaging, that you really don't need that. If I could just add, when I think about what types of organizations do we work with, I just wanted to add that um, some some of the hesitation that organizations may have with rolling out a digital program and wanted to address those real quick. We hear things uh, such as, um, we're not sure if this is still an issue, meaning smoking or tobacco, right? We actually still hear that all the time. And as you mentioned at the top of the presentation, Maggie, this remains the number one cause of preventable death and disease in this country. Uh, And it's not just the profound health implications. um, It's also the cost to employers. It's about $6,000 per employee when you look at claims costs and productivity. Productivity meaning uh, uh, tobacco users and David shaking his head missing um, time due to smoke-related illness. Um, so about $6,000 per employee all total. So there's certainly a financial cost on, on top of the um, really impact of, of the health risk as well. Um, and we also, one, one other quick one before um, you can cut me off, is that we hear uh, that folks wonder if their employees actually want to quit. They wonder if their tobacco users actually want to quit. And the data really tells a story there, which is they do, that 70% of tobacco users do want to quit. The majority of them have tried, and we know it takes multiple times um, to attempt. They're at work for one third of their life, so what better place to give them the tools to be successful? Well, well mentioning that, there's, there's another um, appropriate question from the web, which is what can employers, healthcare organizations, um, community organizations do to create opportunities to, to help people quit before it's too late? And that's for anybody. Can I jump in? I I mean, and I'll sound like a broken record, but I think, you know, we we actually talk about it in our office as being almost like an ethical obligation. I mean, to truly help someone 
successfully quit, you have got to also think about and look at the environment around that individual. And so employers, not only in their own workplaces, but as leaders in their communities, can be champions for tobacco and smoke-free environments, including the workplaces, you know, restaurants, bars, workplaces, the entire um, community approach. The advertising and marketing and, and when people are trying to quit and they're yet bombarded by, you know, going to just get their gasoline and they you know, just bombarded by the, ma the marketing and the advertising, you know, looking at how um, employers, again, because they're such leaders in their communities, can really become a part of those efforts that help wrap that individual around and create then a, a successful context for the individual as they're also then accessing the resources, whether they be digital or, or provider-based or whatever. So I just think that that's oftentimes a little bit seen as a separate piece, but really it's, it's, it's critical to, to ultimately creating that successful environment. I'd like to go back to David if I can. It, there's, there's no good, um, it's no good intervening if you can't track whether it works. Can you talk a little bit about how you track your success with your clients? And we've got him muted again, if we can bring his sound up. Our program facilitator, so she helps manage the data on the backside, capture our enrollment rates uh, on a quarterly basis, but also we, we stay in uh, continuous communication with her to find out if there are changing trends that might be predicated on our social media activity or any other kind of uh, marketing outreach effort that we're involved in. Um, so we look at those numbers, we, we look at the, uh, the quit numbers, um, how many people have reported uh, progress. We, uh, we look at the staying power within the program itself, how many users are utilizing the tools that are part of the kit and which tools are they using most frequently. And that can vary from, uh, from outreach effort to outreach effort, interestingly enough. And, and so there's kind of a combination approach that one has to take uh, where there's various layers involved. We, we also, we, we do direct uh, to consumer advertising to, to borrow that phraseology with our own staff. And so it's included in their orientation as an option to them. Uh, we advertise it on our, our digital monitors throughout the hospital, both to impact our patient population, uh, any visitors that might have exposure uh, to, to those infomercials and also uh, our employees. We have a couple of tobacco free zones. We're, we're a hospital that is tobacco restricted, but not tobacco free yet. So we've been working in concentric uh, circles with our exterior campuses uh, and uh, have been quite successful at uh, leveraging those into tobacco free situations and making sure that we provide adequate communication to our employees so that they're prepared for those changes uh, and offering them nicotine replacement therapy options, uh, conventional class enrollment, as well as our digital uh, platform. Our, our respiratory therapy group is another point I'd like to make. They, they do much in the way of promoting this with our COPD population. They have an ambulatory program uh, where they provide resources and information to those uh, groups that are struggling with addiction uh, and do have interest in quitting. And there is, as it was mentioned previously, a high percentage of those who, uh, who do find cessation to be a, a favorable course to pursue. Thank you so much. We're, we're coming up to three o'clock, but I think we have some time for some Q&A with the audience. Is, is there any question from the audience? No. Nope. If I could go back to um, the previous question about opportunities to engage tobacco users before it's too late, I, I just wanted to add one additional comment there. And it, it, it really applies across the board regardless of the outreach channel, regardless of the treatment modality, um, regardless of the time point of the intervention. And it, it really comes down to compassion. Um, tobacco users often feel enormously stigmatized. Um, policies, restrictive smoking policies, have literally relegated them down the block and in the alley uh, to use tobacco. Uh, the vast majority of tobacco users know that this is a life-threatening behavior, and yet they're trapped with an addiction that, as Jen mentioned, takes multiple quit attempts to break free from. And so I think in any endeavor, it's really critical to come at this topic with warmth and compassion 
and empathy for really what is an absolutely tenacious addiction. I worked with um, longtime chronic drug abusers early on in my training, and the vast majority of them talked about this behavior being more difficult to break free from than those other forms of tobacco use. And so I think when we think about opportunities, it's really about messaging and uh, helping tobacco users to feel supported and not stigmatized. That's such an important point, and, and people often blame themselves as well, um, and, and that's not particularly helpful in, in helping them. I have learned so much from all of you today. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to tell us about what you're doing, what you know, what you don't know, what's working, what's not working. And it's great to know that these devices can do something other than torment us and provide a, a huge amount of entertainment for our teenage children. Robin Koval's going to come up and, and make some closing remarks. But again, thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing from you, Robin. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you to this panel, to Maggie, of course, to Corinne, Amanda, Michael, David, Jen. Um, this has been a great discussion, and I'm so glad we were able to do this. Um, you know, what I think about as I listen to everyone here is, you know, yes, nicotine is a very complex addiction, um, but we have really good tools um, that work, and that we need to stay committed to making them available. Um, and to supporting our smokers in robust and holistic ways. Um, and I thank you all for all of the discussion today. And I'll just say to those of you who, who are listening, um, our partners in healthcare systems, healthcare providers, state health departments, researchers, employers, you know, whoever you are, um, it is so important for us to help the 40 million U.S. adults who still use combustible tobacco. Um, we have great ways to do that. They're effective and they work. Um, and also uh, to think about how we help the millions more youth and young adults who are also trying to quit vaping as we develop new tools to do that as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. Great panel.